Dorothea Dix, social activist and voice for the mentally ill. I tell what I have seen, painful and as shocking as the details often are, that from them you may feel more deeply the imperative obligation which lies upon you to prevent the possibility of a repetition or continuance of such outrages upon humanity. If I inflict pain upon you and move you to horror, it is to acquaint you with suffering which you have the power to alleviate and make you hasten to the relief of the victims of legalized barbarity. This report, called The Memorial, was penned by Dorothea Dix and delivered to the Massachusetts State's Legislature soon after she had completed a statewide investigation of the treatment of the mentally ill. The year was 1843 in antebellum America, and right at the cusp of a social reform that was about to rock the nation. Dorothea Dix was many things, educator, author, nurse. However, her greatest contribution to psychology was her devotion and staunch activism for better treatment of the mentally ill in America. Dorothea Lind Dix was born in 1802 in Hampton, Maine which was then a part of Massachusetts, to Joseph Dix, a minister, and Mary Bigelow. Her family was of meager means. Her mother had poor health and her father traveled often. Due to her parents' neglect, she became the main caretaker for her two younger brothers at an early age. She left home at the age of 12 to live with her grandmother in Boston. Between ages 14 and 15, she started a private school for children and five years later opened the Dix Mansion, a school for young women. Bostonians soon began sending their daughters to her for education. One such Bostonian was preacher William Ellery Channing, who became one of her early supporters. Dix had a long history of less than stellar physical and emotional health since childhood, in part due to her long work hours and responsibilities as a caretaker. But in 1827, Dix fell severely ill, suffering from lung problems, pain, and hemorrhaging. She willfully juggled her poor health and teaching duties for a handful of years until 1836, when her health was so poor that physicians insisted she stop teaching as a matter of life or death. She paused her teaching and traveled to England to improve her health. In England, Dix became familiar with the work of French doctor Philippe Penel, who had campaigned for prison reform in the late 18th century. She also learned of William Tuke, who had founded a sanctuary for the mentally ill in England called the Retreat at York. Finally, she learned of the ideal of moral therapy. At a time when the mentally ill were judged and promptly incarcerated, moral therapy argued that this type of treatment was both inhumane and counterproductive. Instead, the mentally ill should be treated with compassion. In 1837, Dix learned of her grandmother's death and returned to the United States to continue her recovery, bringing with her newfound knowledge on moral therapy. March 1841 was the turning point in Dix's career from that of an educator to a social reformer. She had begun teaching Sunday school at the East Cambridge Jail, a women's prison. There, she discovered the poor living conditions of the inmates, many of whom were mentally ill. At the time, it was common for people with mental illness to end up incarcerated in general purpose jails. They were housed together in unheated, unfurnished, and dirty rooms, huddled together and shivering from the cold New England weather. When she asked why the inmates were not provided heat, she was informed that the insane do not feel heat or cold. She immediately took the matter to court and secured heat along with other improvements for the inmates. Under her persistence, the living quarters at the jail were improved. After her success at East Cambridge Jail, Dix began an 18-month tour of other jails and almshouses in the entire state of Massachusetts. She learned that virtually all of them had the same terrible living conditions for inmates. The treatment of prisoners, particularly those with mental illness, were miserable and inhumane. 
she extensively documented the poor conditions in her visits with jailers, caretakers, and townspeople. Dix could not directly address the legislature because she was a woman. Instead, she successfully rallied influential men like Charles Sumner, Horace Mann, Luther Vose Bell, and Samuel Gridley Howe to her cause. She detailed her findings in a memorial that was to be delivered to the Massachusetts legislature in 1843. In the memorial, she writes, I proceed, gentlemen, briefly to call your attention to the present state of insane persons confined within this commonwealth in cages, closets, cellars, stalls, pens, chained, naked, beaten with rods, and lashed into obedience. With the help from Dix's male supporters, the memorial was delivered to the legislature floor and the appeal won them funding for the expansion of the Worcester State Hospital. Following her success in Massachusetts, Dix continued to advocate and lobby for improved conditions for those with mental illness across the United States. She repeated her procedure of traveling to jails and almshouses and documenting what she saw. Although she still had poor health, she traveled throughout the United States and later to Europe to advocate for the mentally ill. Dix returned to the United States in 1856. When the Civil War started in 1861, Dix was designated the Superintendent of Army Nurses for the Union, where she gained respect for treating Confederate and Union soldiers alike. Over her 40-year career as a mental health reformer, Dorothea Dix was responsible for the creation of 32 mental asylums, 15 schools for the feeble-minded, a school for the blind, and a number of training facilities for nurses. She was also instrumental in establishing libraries in prisons, mental hospitals, and other institutions. According to John Reisman in his book, A History of Clinical Psychology, Dix's bearing was quiet, gentle, and dignified, but her tactics were overwhelming. She would arm herself with unshakable facts concerning the quality of the mental health facilities of a particular area, rally public support through the press, and win key legislative figures to her cause by her knowledge, persistence, and dedication. Dorothea Dix was not directly involved in the feminist movement, but she demonstrated to the male-dominated society at the time that women could be assertive, independent, and influential in matters of politics and social change. Indeed, she garnered social change by rallying the community, influencing policymakers, and shaping public opinion. And although she disliked fame and gratitude for her work in social reform, Dix was nonetheless a pioneer in a national movement for mental health reform and a major contributor to the spread of moral therapy principles to the United States. These achievements, in turn, shaped the field of psychology, especially in how society viewed psychopathology. <laughs>